Good morning. My name is Aisa Tutusoko. I'm the WHO Technical Officer for Essential Drug and Medicine for West Africa. Um, we are based in Brazzaville at the Regional Office for Africa. I'm pleased to speak with you about the need of securing medicine in the African region and to discuss the access to medicine in the African region. I thank the Pharma Logistic Committee for this invitation to this important event. Today in my presentation, we shall discuss about the regional situation, giving an overview of the regional and global supply mechanism. Then we'll discuss on local manufacturing and we will touch on the bar actual barriers existing and the actual solutions that we are proposing. The colossal work done by countries has resulted in 14 seven countries in the African region having national medicine policies and almost as many of them having national essential medicine lists as a basis to prioritize investment. In recent years, the capacity of countries has been considerably strengthened, particularly for appropriate selection of medicine by prioritizing new innovations. Today, the majority of countries have integrated dolitography, for example, into the essential medicine list, and many of them are in the process of establishing essential diagnostic lists to contribute to the decentralization of diagnostic tests to primary healthcare facilities. WHO has intensified its efforts towards market intelligence to ensure that when an innovation is available, it can be made financially accessible in low and middle income countries. For example, as a result, today, a direct action anti-hepatitis has been a significant, has seen a significant reduction from 2000 US dollar to less than 300 uh, US dollar in 2018 in Burkina Faso and Kenya. In the context of the implementation of the WHO Universal Health Coverage Flagship Program, Countries have been supported to develop and implement UAC roadmaps, integrated specific needs for the supplies of uh, anti-malarials, ARTs, anti-hepatitis, and all types of medicines. Countries such as Congo and Niger are implementing innovative procurement strategy based on revitalization of public procurement mechanisms towards the highest possible quality assurance model thanks to this universal health coverage flagship and roadmap. We also need to acknowledge considerable efforts concentrated in the strategic review of national policies, introducing now concept of equity. Two thirds of countries in the region have provision in the legislation for tax exemption and waivers for pharmaceuticals. In the meantime, our regulatory system have made significant progress in transitioning to more autonomous organizational models, which are seen to deliver faster and more effective regulatory outcome, like a dossier assessment, pharmacovigilance, and post-marketing surveillance for therapies. Tanzania and Ghana regulatory authorities have reached the maturity level three, which means their regulatory system are stable, well-functioning, and, and can play vital role for enhancing local manufacturing in Africa. The African Medicine Agency, AMA, will complement efforts in countries in creating a sustainable environment for enhanced investment in quality assurance. To date, only two countries in West Africa, Mali and Burkina Faso, has ratified that. And when we talk about East Africa and Africa in general, we have only six countries that are ratified the AMA, and we need 15 to make it operational. One of the key lessons learned from the current pandemic is that going individually to the international market to procure and negotiate appropriate price for supplies can be extremely difficult, even impossible for low income country. The closure of borders and lockdown in countries place export restriction on priority medicine, including anti-malarial ARVs thus potentially creating tension and stock out in both public and private distribution channels. In addition, transport and export restrictions increase lead times 
and expose countries to talk up, which seriously affects the access to quality assured medicine and health technology. Moreover, the number of disruption has increased considerably for all medicine, reaching an average of 24% for the region, as you can see here. But at the individual country level, it has reached 40% for some countries. Here through the cloud of world, we see that the products most susceptible to breakage are uh, malaria, above amplification reagent, and it means that testing products in general, with the term test kit and qualitative amplification being recurrent terms. Without diagnostic, we cannot have access, we cannot have better decision, be, a good decision making for treatment. This is consistent with the increase in stock tension, knowing that the product lead time is about three to six months, it, and it is required for the, at the supplier level. And even if a supplier is identified actually, Central Medical so has notified that price have increased for many medicines due to the market inflation, with price sometimes doubling, for example, for azithromycin. In addition to the additional initial cost, transport costs also are now adding up to 30% of the value of the medicines. This reveals the deep gap in local production and pre-qualification of manufacturers on the continent that are entirely dependent on imports. WHO is actually supporting many states in monitoring medicine stocks. And when needed, WHO work with countries on bespoken solutions, such as inter-country stock lending, strategic procurement, and identification of intermediate um, transport solutions. At the same time, the transition to more accessible therapeutic equivalents is underway in many countries, where WHO is also supporting the implementation of when needed interim guidelines or therapeutic equivalence guidelines to just buffer this disruption. In summary, the actual bottlenecks are representative of those identified before the pandemic and which impact the pharmaceutical value chain, such as the high fragmentation of the supply chain, the limited access to market information, but also the availability of information at the national level through an LMIS uh, system that does not inform decision-making. Unsustainable funding and weak domestic investment also jeopardize efforts. Deficiency in policy, leadership and governance result the lack of incentive and unnecessary difficulties for local manufacturing. The multiplicity of procurement procedure and regulatory requirement is another important barrier for building coordinated supply chain across the continent. And I do recognize that sometimes partners are contributing to this multiplicity and fragmentation. We have here one of the best current example of partnership that we, that we should replicate for continuous supplies of medicine in Africa. For upgrade supply issues related to the pandemic, the commodities for COVID-19 are poor procured with lowest price and appropriate quality assurance policy. In the same vein, actually, WHO has been also supporting the small islands developing states, seeds, and the African Association of Central Medical Stores, ACAM, and also the regional economic and also regional economic community to develop coordinated procurement and supply mechanisms, which include HIV commodities also, but also NCD medicines. And we, on the longer term, we are also targeting some vaccines. The global and regional coordinated supply mechanism need to be complemented by robust local manufacturing capacity to sustain access to essential health products. African leaders have already identified the need to develop this industry through the adoption of the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan of Africa and his related business plan. However, the product manufactured locally must comply with international standards and I'm glad that the regulatory landscape of the continent is getting more and more stronger. 
uh, 38 countries in Africa had, mani fa had pharmaceutical manufacturer entities. WHO has worked with manufacturers in Ghana and Nigeria to improve capacities for the manufacturer and quality assurance. But we definitely need more manufacturers applying to the pre-qualification program. In conclusion, these challenges call above all for action. Removing systematically all the barriers is an important task to be carried out urgently to strengthen our member state procurement and supply chain system. The main possible areas proposed are the improvement of cross-border collaboration for better procurement and supply practices. For example, sharing information on suppliers, purchasing price, and as an intern solution, we need to mitigate the disruption and stock tension by revitalizing the emergency, the emergency stock we need to see in many countries and agreeing on procedure for borrowing and repayment either from stock or between countries. It also opens the door to the implementation of innovative mechanisms such as pool procurement, which improves the efficiency of purchasing systems. And finally, there is an urgent need to scale up information management system, such as LMIS, and to set up early warning system to prevent the disruption. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.